Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Dino Joe Show. Thank you all for being here. We've got a good one this evening. Our guest tonight is an actor that has worked on many, many incredible projects in the UK and the US, a US program as well. Notable works include Rage with Luferino, Broadchurch, Gallivan, and many more. He's also a YouTuber on hiatus and a personal friend of mine that joining me live is... A Wemberway, Ryan Wembridge. You have Bonjour, built me up senor. so much there. That is, <laughs> you have built me up so much. You are about to chuck a bucket of water on the poor people's bonfire right now. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm flattered. And it's, oh God, it's like, I don't know if you ever saw it at the Comic-Con um, before the, uh, when Mark Ruffalo was announced as the Hulk and no one knew. And they thought it was the original Hulk, and they went retaining the role, and everyone, eh, they went Mark Ruffalo, and everyone, eh, eh. <laughs> I feel like that's why, you know. <laughs> I'm sure there's plenty of people happy to see you, mate. I'm sure there oh, is. We've got shucks. Harry in, we've got Corey in. Nice to see you, fellas. Nice to see you. Um, right, let's get a little icebreaker then, Ryan. Before we get into the nitty gritty, let's start yeah. with something a little bit fun. Uh, if you could choose any fictional character from literature, film, or TV to spend the day with, who would it be and why? I mean, the obvious choice for me is Doctor Who, just because quite literally time, space, any direction. But historically, his companions haven't done well, have they? So, <laughs> so yeah. I'll probably you make a great Amy Pond. Oh, I got the legs for it. Um, I got the hair, really. <laughs> um, all the looks. Um, <laughs> I think a really random one, maybe, if not, would be probably someone like Sora from Kingdom Hearts. Just because, oh, cool. yeah, again, Doctor Who's like an obvious choice, but again, Kingdom Hearts, I mean, you get to travel between all the Disney realms. you got the Keyblade. Yeah, I'll let him deal with Heartless and stuff. But it'd be pretty cool to basically be in the Disney-verse for a period. That might be a cool one. And Star Wars is officially Disney. They haven't done it in Kingdom Hearts yet, but who knows? <laughs> And Marvel. Mm, a what if? A what if? Yeah, a what you if? never know. Oh, you never know. Could you imagine? It turns out <laughs> with a keyblade, yeah. just wax Iron Man around the head. <laughs> um, for those in the chat and for those who have just joined us, welcome to the show. Tonight we're joined by a Wemberway, Ryan Wembridge. For those who don't know Ryan's work, you can scan the QR. QR? Which way is it? That way, the QR code underneath Ryan, and it will take you straight to his IMDb so you can see what projects Ryan has been in the past. Um, any questions for Ryan and that you'd like to ask, buy them away in the chat below and we will get into them a bit later on in the show. So then, Ryan, um, let's start by asking you, what age did you first get the bug for acting? Was it in drama, in school? Was it even uh, yeah. younger than that? Regrettably, GCSE drama, of which we were at the same school, so you'll probably recall the teachers we had. Um, but yeah, GCSE drama was where I kind of caught the bug because I'd never done anything like it before um but particularly for film acting really random fun fact the first ever gig i did and i don't know if you remember this a local director uh, by the name of paul dudbridge was doing a short film called maria and i don't know if it was for a short for film festival i can't recall if it was a short film festival or something at the time but the whole point was she was supposed to be playing a teacher in a school. So he actually filmed in Bradley Stoke Community School. And at the time, the drama department of BSA said, any young kids who want to play extras as background school children, you're more than welcome to be in the background. And um, one of my closest friends really ribs me on that because the one cutaway you have of me, I was supposed to be eating a crisp during lunch hall uh, and you see me proceed to start choking on it. Um, and they kept that. It's just me going like this on screen. Um, so that was my first ever background gig. But I got talking to the director as a young lad saying, oh, I'd love to do, you know, acting, particularly for camera. Um, and he used to run a thing called the or a, a group called the ITV West Television Workshop in the Bristol City Centre um, in the ITV station, which was basically mm -hmm. teaching young actors how to act for camera. Um, unfortunately, they've closed down now, but the patron of it was Emma Thompson, um, Nanny McPhee. So it was quite a big thing for me at the time, um, and it allowed me to do lots of different extra acting bits as a, a young lad, yeah. Very, very nice. I didn't realise that was in the middle of um, 
in the middle of town. I didn't realise there was an ITV in the yeah. middle of Bristol. It was always Cardiff from what I would have thought. It's an old one. It's I'm not sh really sure best place to the area. But if you Google it, there used to be an old ITV station that was in the area, yeah. So what age would you have been then? Like 14, something like that? I was about 14, 15. But at the time, because particularly in screen acting, there's very, particularly in the UK as well, very strict laws with regards to younger actors. Mm -hmm. um, pretty much unless, you know, you've got a specific agent and there's a whole procedure behind it that I'm not familiar with. But um, I didn't really do actual on-set well, again, I said the short film, but in terms of what you would consider bigger productions, um, I wasn't allowed to do till I was 16, uh, which I okay. did through an extras agency in Bristol. Very nice. That's interesting now you can... So what was the sort of restrictions before you are 16? Pretty much you couldn't be on set unless you had... So child actors have, from my awareness, um, so like they can only work a certain number of hours. They must have a chaperone at all times. Um, various other things. They can only be involved in certain scenes. You have to have permission from the parents. Um, there's probably other various laws and legislation regarding the protection of child actors. So, but yeah, so at the time, for myself, like any extras work you wanted to do, unless you're above the age of 16, it was like, nope, you're not allowed. Really? That is interesting. Well, well, yeah, well, now you think about it, actually, it's not often you see kids as extras, and that, yeah, that explains why. Mm, particularly mm. in UK. I mean, even the guy who did the short film, Paul Dudbridge in BSCS, um, he was very much like, again, the hours were fairly short. You know, the, the younger, us as kids, we were on set for like three, four hours. I think it was, I don't even know if it was that. I might be wrong because I don't want to say anything that would imply he kept child actors on set longer than he should. But it was short periods. And of course, he met all the, but he was very on it. Um, so yeah, it is very much a strict thing. I don't know if the industry's changed because um, since COVID, I must admit, I haven't done too much since because um, COVID wrecked the industry heavily. Um, but yeah, so that was that. And then just for a bit of humour for you, my first gig was Casualty, uh, in which I played a dying guy in a bed. <laughs> <laughs> and how, 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 did you, how did you prepare? How did I prepare? <laughs> uh, pretended to sleep. Uh, do you know what? This sounds really weird. It was actually... Weirdly difficult. I'm a person who likes to fall asleep everywhere. Uh, I think I sent you a um, behind the scenes shot of me just asleep on the set somewhere, and you're not supposed to fall asleep on set, particularly as an extra. That's a no go. You you are the you are the peasants. You do you do what <laughs> you are told. You do not fall asleep. Um, so I had to lay for five six hours in a hospital bed, not falling asleep, while the actors who played doctors and casualty would do different things to try and wind me up, like poke me, you know, uh, wet willy. And all that, like, do something just to try and distract me and annoy me while I'm just in a bed game. Uh, it was good fun. <laughs> what did you find more nerve wracking? That is your first role, mm. or performing performing in school, GCSE in front of your peers? That one, because just yeah, GCSE draw. I think as well. Do you know? I would rather perform. I think to a certain aspect, to a crowd of ten thousand who don't know me, than a crowd of a uh, hundred of rx school alumni <laughs> yeah I, I'm, I'm completely i'm completely the same when i find out that like someone from school or um even like family members to an extent mm. like know about even know about youtube for example i yeah. find that really like i get really anxious about it knowing that yeah somebody it's knows, weird isn't like, it? it's, i can it's i can walk around a comic-con with a camera and not and not care less it's so it's so bizarre isn't it some survival instincts kicking in <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, the first TV work you did then after Casualty, was it Father Brown? Oh, that's a tricky one. Uh, I think it... So there's a couple that... Father Brown was one of them that definitely mm -hmm. sticks to mind. And that was just great fun because Mark Williams, the guy who played Ron Weasley's dad, um, as Father Brown, he was just an absolute legend. He was just a top man. Um, I was stood very close to him. I personally won't forget that day of filming, uh, and I'll come on to why, but Father Brown was one. Um, I actually ended up doing a walk-on, which for, for film terminology, you've got extras, or they don't like to call you extras, to be honest. They call you supporting artists. Essays is the technical term they like to use. And then you've got basically what's called walk-ons, um, or there's another term that escapes my mind, but a walk-on is someone 
who basically appears on camera as a character but says less than nine words. Because after you say more than nine words, I believe it is, might have changed this, they have to pay you more. So I'll walk on is so yeah, so there's there's famous stories of walk-ons being told, you know, say this, and they try and get over the nine word count. And the director's like, no, we're not paying you that. <laughs> but I had a walk-on for casualty um for a Christmas Eve, New Year's Eve special, playing a drunk hooligan. There's a theme to that. Um Father Brown, I did another short sit web series with Paul Dubbridge, where I was a thug who had to raid a shop theme. Um <laughs> And I also did a show called Gallivant, where I had to pay a peasant robbing a store theme. There's a there's a there's a trend here. Talk about being typecast already. They clearly thought clearly <laughs> thought extremely highly of you. They did, yeah. They looked at one look at me and was like, cream of the crop there. What's he doing? He's robbing that old biddy. Um <laughs> that's, that's how they saw it. That's before you got the role, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was when he was on break. <laughs> that was the audition. I hadn't even entered the room yet. <laughs> um, but yeah. Touching. Sorry, carry on. Yeah, no, no, go. Um, touching on auditions, um, mm. how how was it that you first got a role? After, so after school, yeah. So auditioning is again. So I personally never went to drama university. Um, I was very much brought up, and to be honest, I'm I'm personally very thankful for this because I wasn't talented enough not to do this. Um, I was brought up with the philosophy by my parents of get a, you know, your typical stable job that allows you to own a house um, and do. And once you find yourself in a position where you've got enough liquid income that you can do something like acting, do it then, which in aspect is still a goal of mine, you know, to be able to live and just do acting if I ever wanted uh, something to work towards. But because of that, I didn't go to a drama university. Um, so I very much again, relied on ITV. Um, I did get an agent for a period. Um, I had an agent, which again was go into Cardiff, um, go through the audition process, which is basically they pick a script or a monologue um, for you to read. They'll ask you about yourself, see if you're very interpersonal. Um, again, of course, assess your acting ability, how you tend to act, what characters you may fit. Um, because again, something that a lot of people don't always consider. I mean, when you see like big actors, of course, you know, you, I don't know, your Tom Hardy's, your Killian Murphy's, etc. They, they've at, at that elite status and at the as masters of their craft, um, they can mold into any character. But particularly when you're starting out, you they try and find you the role that fits not just your personality, but you know your height, your build. Um, you have to, that sort of thing. yeah, you have to really almost be the initial character that they want you to be, um, and meet that. I mean, you hear that sort of talk when they talk about the recent um, live action One Piece about mm -hmm. how they knew exactly what they were looking for in the cast. They knew exactly who they wanted to play Luffy, or who they wanted to play. Um, all the other characters' names just fell out of my head. Um, which is really annoying. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, they really wanted them to embody that cast. So particularly early on, it's you're trying to find the role almost that is the closest representation to you that you can put on screen and yeah. hope that the director, that's what they had for their vision of whatever they wanted the character to be. Um and yeah, so it's a bit weird. So I did audition for Broadchurch. Um, I said I was, in, like you said, I was in Broadchurch. But again, as a supporting artist, um, consider what you had last week. I'm like, you know. Uh, <laughs> but I did do an audition for Broadchurch. But little things like, um, I, again, I did the audition process. But one of the comments I had, um, the scene in question is in the third scene of the third series of Broadchurch, which are basically three lads of bullying David Tennant's character's daughter and he has to thrash them like a father and be like i deal with murderers yada 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 i can deal with you but one of the aspects of that of course was david tennant who's about my height um and slimmer in frame than me had to belittle you know these teenagers who thought they were all this that i think what we would call them these days is roadmen. um but when i'm 
you know, six foot, even at that age, broader than him, it didn't convey <laughs> what the director wanted because I'm the same height as him. So he's not belittling me now. I'm challenging him. I'm at the same height. I could be a threat. And that's not what they wanted the scene to represent. So I didn't get that. Um, I auditioned for Deep Blue Sea 2. I don't even know if that ever came out or if it was a straight to DVD. Um, but my American accent is <laughs> terrible. Um, I can't do one. It's shocking. Um so, yeah, I suppose you just basically read the script, create what you envision the character to be, and just hope that whatever the director foresees for that is what you bring to the table. And mm -hmm. that's really it. You know, you could be... You, you hear stories of, like, Eddie Redmayne, for example, um, who is, again, incredible actor. Um, he auditioned for Bilbo Baggins in The Hobbit. And he admits on the Graham Norton show that he did like a really weird, like, oh, my name is Bilbo Baggins kind of thing. And the director went, no, 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 no. And of course it went to Martin Freeman. But again, there's a prime example of, you know, two incredible actors, but it was just who represented what they wanted the character to be the best. And of course, once you break that mold and you break that role, then you'll get a popularity behind you. And then because you'll sell via name, then you start to find yourself building more and more not to say, because you still have to be, of course, a phenomenal actor in your craft, of course. That is, yeah, that is quite funny. It reminds me of, um, have you ever seen the audition tapes of The Office US? And it's just like a stream of crazy, crazy talented actors. And they're just yeah. auditioning for various roles. And you can actually see them as it, but obviously the director must have had such a clear vision of, no, it has to be specifically this. Because, for example... Um, I think Seth Rogen, uh, there's, there's mm. clips of Seth Rogen um, auditioning for like the role of Dwight, which yeah. watching, watching as an audition tape, yeah. you'd look and go, I'm surprised you didn't get that. But it must be like so spot on as um, as a vision that it opens, I mean, I, um, yeah. I don't know if this is true, um, so don't quote me on this, but I believe at one point I heard that when Tom Holland went for Spider-Man, the other possible cast was Timothy Chalamet. Dude. Mm. So, and again, it's like, you know, there's a certain level when, and you're at that pantheon of actors. Because again, some people don't realize that before Spider-Man, Tom Holland was in The Impossible with Ewan McGregor. And he's phenomenal in that. Brilliant. as a, And he's a child actor in that. Hmm. Um, and he was Billy Elliot and stuff. So he had like quite a range before that. Um, and again, it's kind of like building that repertoire um, and that sort of thing. And something that a lot of them don't want you to do, of course, is when you do enough essay work, you get tight cast of you're just an essay. You don't do mm. acting. And some people manage to break through through walk-ons and all that and get, you know, that they find that way to wiggle through. But it is a tough industry as well. Yeah, I can imagine so. Like I said, my camera well, um, to like focus on me. <laughs> <laughs> um so the first the first time you went for a role, did you go mm. go for it yourself or did you get in touch with like an agency or something like that? Went for it myself. Um, it was actually through ITV. I said about the television workshop. There was mm. a local director who was quite big in the short film space, looking to cast um, people in her film in her short film. So I actually went for that, and I got through a few rounds. Um, but unfortunately, again, my representation of what I thought the character would be didn't match whatever the director had. So I'm trying to think about it. I mean. I did a lot of acting at uni as well, but of course that naturally doesn't fall under the category of that. But in terms of auditioning, to be frank, if I'm thinking, did I audition for anything big and get it? No. <laughs> no, I didn't. Um, but again, when you see, you know, who got the role, you're like, well, obviously. <laughs> and it, it, it makes sense. Um, yeah, and I guess about, there's just an element of, when you go, you know, you just got to try and find that role that fits your personality. Again, when you think about it, you know, Ryan Reynolds as Deadpool, but he made that himself. Yeah. Tony or Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man. You know, you it, it's Robert Downey Jr. to an aspect is Iron Man. Like, you know, his, mm -hmm. his, when you think of, because of course I know that he had stuff prior to Iron Man, um, but when you think of his personality and you see him on talk shows, Iron Man was just him, in not not in a you know derogatory sense, because of course it's you still got to carry that and make it look natural in a camera, which is so difficult to do. 
yeah. but it was a large percentage of his personality there. And then he then went on to do other things, you know, like Eisenhower and all this kind of stuff, where or um, Tropic Thunder, where he plays something very different to himself. But that initial breakthrough role was the closest representation to his personality that there was. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Mm. Yeah, very interesting. Um, with your essay work, do you feel that where we lived, obviously being so close to Bristol and Cardiff with the BBC, mm. and I, well, BBC especially in Bristol and Cardiff, do you think that that gave you better odds and gave, gave you the edge of picking up that sort of work early on? Yeah, absolutely. I think Wales particularly and Bristol are very underrated in the film space. I mean, when you typically think about filming big things, you either think, you know, you New York or in the UK particularly, you think London, Pinewood Studios, which is your big blockbuster things. But for example, like Cardiff, there's a Pinewood Studios in Cardiff, a small yeah. one that people don't really know about. Um, mm. When I was filming HBO's industry, his Dark Materials, James McAvoy was next door. Um, you have... And again, you know, in particularly all the British-based, or quite a lot of the British-based BBC dramas, not like your soaps, like Casualty and all that, because they have their own independent locations, but Doctor Who, uh, Sherlock, Merlin, all that kind of stuff, Casualty, is filmed in Cardiff, very locally. So, yeah, it's a bit bonkers. Yeah, Do Doctor Who especially... Um... I can't remember the name of the website off the top of my head, but it's it's like it might be called Film Locator or something like that, and it it can show you on a map where stuff has been filmed, and basically all in and around yeah. the southwest, especially South Wales, within like 25, 30 miles square radius. There's so much stuff, especially oh, especially so Doctor much. Who, it's crazy. And like Sex Education, Sex Education is yeah. all. I had friends in that. It's weird. Oh, really? Yeah, I had friends who were in sex ed. The the essay space is quite eventually gets quite small. You mm -hmm. eventually start meeting everyone again, um, and particularly with industry, industry HBO's industry was so big in terms of like essays, and it was a weird, it was a lovely thing to be a part of because it was recurring essays. They didn't, you know, typically when you do a show, you know, it's essays for a day or a week, you know, while you film this scene, whereas HBO industry we were playing traders on the trading floor and the entire show took place around that concept. So they, all the essays that turned up for the first few couple of weeks of filming, they basically just went, right, all you essays, you're the traders now, you're going to come back every time we shoot these scenes. And we were there for over six months filming um, on set in Cardiff. And it was long hours, mind. It was, you know, for me, it was like up at half five, leave at half six to get to set for half seven or get there, make up at, you know, breakfast quickly, make up at like eight, nine for all the essays, on set at nine, half nine, shoot until 10 in the evening, drive home, rinse, repeat. Busy. Busy, very. And a lot of waiting around. Um, but HBO industry was special because the cast, the, the essays got to know the crew. And the crew on that season, the season that I was on, season one, were just brilliant. All of them, so lovely. Just a, a great bunch of people. And eventually they started to get to obviously know the essays. So mm -hmm. we started developing like a relationship but with all of them. And we could have a bit of a laugh with them. So it really felt, you know, tight-knit, which was really something wonderful to be a part of. Did it start to get almost like who you know at that point? Is that... Yeah. Like for then, for example, did that lead into other work going forward by working on certain For projects? me, no. Uh, it could have in the sense that because I did that, I got asked to be on a lot more things because, again, it is a case of who you know, not what you know sometimes. And also when you've been around all those people and they know you, they'll be like, oh, bring him on. He's good fun. He's a good laugh. You know, and that sort of happened. So once I did HBO Industry... I started getting to the point, you know, before it was like, oh, do you want to be a part of this? I got so much filtering through going, do you want to do this? 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 Um, and at the time, though, where HBO, that was literally near the time that COVID was starting. So this was when the industry mm -hmm. then got decimated um, mm -hmm. in every way, um, kind of bonkers. So, yeah. And then from that, I unfortunately got a responsible job. 
not unfortunately. <laughs> that's, that's a lie. I, that's a lie, to be honest. I, I'm very blessed with the job I do now, and I enjoy it. Um, but yeah, but it what? It, but in terms of acting, I do miss it. But um, you, maybe one day I'll do it again <laughs> when I'm allowed. <laughs> <laughs> when you're allowed when I'm allowed at the moment <laughs> job doesn't permit at the moment as I said I very much enjoy the job and adult responsibilities at the moment <laughs> mm, yeah scary responsibilities aren't they <laughs> yes um, 2015 was a very busy year for you um, Casualty Gallivant Broadchurch mm. and Horizon um, at this point were you sort of thinking hmm I could do this forever now and, I, and, how did, and how did you sort of juggle it? Because when you like, you must have been about halfway through uni at that point. Uh, so I typically over the summer holidays was when I did a lot of acting um, in short stints. Um, and also I worked in a pub, excuse me, in a pub during that time. And this is the thing. You obviously hear a lot that, oh, actors and waitresses work in pubs and all this kind of stuff. That's not necessarily because that they... Uh, of were that carefully that's not because you know that they're not necessarily extremely intelligent individuals or people who could not find other careers but that line of work is the only type of work typically that will allow you at a moment's notice to drop everything to go to an audition mm -hmm. so or film work so it's a lot easier to do that than in your typical nine to five company where you know you have certain targets deadlines expectations whereas in that environment you have the ability to pretty much just up and leave so that's more so why it's very easy for actors and actresses to find themselves within those roles because should they get an audition they have the capacity to go i'm not coming in this day or someone find me cover someone do this i'll pay you back etc so i was doing that at the same time busy mm. very busy yes. so there's a lot of uh, mainly in the summer then so in the, in that summer span especially in 2015, you did yeah. all of that work basically during the summer. From my recollection, yeah. That. Literally six, well, uni holidays, so back in June, go back in September, so June, July, June, July, August, September, four months, one a month. Felt, I bet that felt like an absolute whirlwind. It did, because again, when you're coming back from uni, that's the sort of thing you want to do as well. Um, while you're studying, you know, you're like, oh, I'd love to do this. And, you know, you get the bug for it. Um, but again, it's funny because you're doing essay work, but you're aware that if you wanted to do more mainstream things, more mainstream acting or voice acting or whatever it is, then it's not something you really want to do with a too frequent occurrence. You know, you've got to mm -hmm. find that balance of working on set, but not typecasting yourself as an essay, which, to be honest, again, I didn't really, like I said, you built me up so much. I, do, I got to work on some incredible sets, but apart from a couple of walk-ons, never really credited a role i've i've seen some some credited roles on your IMDb. I'm thinking of, well they're credited if you look as essays in that sense but again in, industry was different as well <coughs> Excuse me. because i'd actually did and i couldn't find the picture of it but my character officially got given a name i got given a name with my face named character you do see me in a couple of scenes um on camera, I had a bit of a walk on in it as well. So I turn up frequently over that, and which was the more frequented one. I got a bit of a story about that actually, which will make you laugh, which is at my expense. Um, HBO's industry. Again, as I said, fantastic piece of work to be a part of. But it is HBO, which tends to be more adult than certain other channel producers, Game of Thrones. Um, so I did HBO industry and everything was on the trading floor and everything was very much stock shares exchange, London, yada, yada, yada. So while doing it, and cause I was joining it, I was loving it. A couple of walk-ons I told, you know, my family, you know, watch this. I told the fiance's grandparents to watch it, yada, yada, yada. Um, sat down at the sofa with my mother, her partner, my fiance. And within the first scene, um, I, or within the first couple of scenes, I got a text from a friend who was on set, which is all caps of just don't watch it with your family. And immediately on camera was one of the main lead actresses doing very explicit things to herself down a webcam. And, <laughs> and my mother just Enjoy, went, what Enjoy is your this, dinner. 
<laughs> Enjoy um, your dinner, mum. I'll be on in a minute. I'm on in a minute. <laughs> Fran's grandparents calling her going, what's your fiancé making us watch? This is dirty. And I'm just in the sofa going, what have I done? So, yeah. <laughs> very, very awkward. I'm, uh, yeah, I imagine there wasn't much conversation around dinner if you had that afterwards. Well, Tea anyone? <laughs> I just kind of was just kind of sat with my head in my hands going, oh, I told my boss to watch this. <laughs> uh, and then just a list of all the people I told to watch it and going, oh, no. Ooh. <laughs> uh. Yeah. Um, we touched upon, upon, upon broad, ter- broad Church earlier. Mm. Here we go. Um, if I recall, you have quite a funny story um, surrounding yourself and David Tennant, don't you? I have two. I have two. One was with Mr. Tennant, who again, I got, to, in fact, a couple of, two stories with Mr. Tennant, to be precise, uh, which were just him being a lovely stand-up gentleman that he is. And one with Olivia Coleman, who again, just an incredibly lovely woman. The two were David Tennant. So for Broadchurch, I was in season two, uh, where they do the court scenes, where they're trying to convict the killer from season one. Um, and we actually filmed the court scenes at Exeter University. So they turned Exeter University campus, one of the buildings, to look like court scenes. Mm-hmm. Um, and the first memory of David Tennant was, it was quite funny because, of course, they made this entire building look like a court scene. They added, you know, security barriers. Uh, my dad was on set as well with me all the time for this one. So he was dressed as a security guard, you know, like, see if people had, you know, metal on them, etc. which was quite funny because you had students walking in and all the people playing fake security guards were scanning people. They kept it up <laughs> just to do it. And some woman came in and was going, oh, excuse me, officer, can I park there? And he was like, oh, I'm not actually an officer. I'm going to have to admit this now. <laughs> um, but anyway, this young, very young boy, uh, toddler, quite a young age, I can't recall, I think it was say six or seven, came in wearing a TARDIS backpack. And David Tennant was in the middle of the room. Um, now, he didn't look like Doctor Who at this time. He looked like his Broadchurch character. I think it's Alan something. Um I can't recall off the top of my head, but he has a beard, um, quite a rough beard and a comb over. So, you know, you're not instantly going to recognize him as, you know, the doctor. He hasn't got his spiky hair clean shaven. Um, And this little toddler just kind of looked at him, kind of locked eyes with him. And he's got his mother trailing behind him. And he just kind of runs up to David Tennant and just hugs his leg and just holds on to him. (laughs) And David Tennant is smiling and laughing, kind of like, you know, oh, bless you. And the mother kind of goes, like, kind of grabs this boy. He goes, why are you hugging this poor man's leg? Oh, you're David Tennant. I am so sorry. And as she kind of pulls this kid, she's kind of pulling David Tennant's leg at the same time as he's just hugging. Bless him. So that was one incident. But again, I think he, from my recollection, he turned the boy around, signed the backpack, and was like, you know, give him a bit of a hug. So again, top man. And the other one was he was behind me in the lunch queue. Um, So... Uh, this this will this will feed into an industry story, um, which was very funny, um, and it's just the way the film industry is, not in a negative sense. Um, but I was in the lunch queue, and typically, as I said, when you are an essay, you are the peasant. You are last <laughs> in the lunch queue. You are last to get your food. Um, naturally, again, the director is some big hot shot organizing multi million dollar filming. You've then got the lead actors who are these people: David Tennant, Olivia Coleman, yada yada yada. So their needs have to be met naturally. Um, but I ended up at one point with David Tennant behind me in the queue. And I kind of said, like, oh, you first, Mr. Tennant. And in a very Scottish accent, kind of, don't be daft, lad. And I remember just going, and just locking, looking at him, like, and he kind of laughed and he was like, not used to the Scottish. And I was like, no, not really. I'm used to seeing you in Doctor Who. And on a dime, switched his accent. It was like, oh, like this. Um, and again, just a really pleasant, fantastic, down to earth man. And again, at the time, I was internally fangirling, to say the least. Um, but yeah, yeah, I like you. Um, that was before Hu Yang. Yeah, that was before Hu Yang. Exactly. I know, don't. Oh, oh. Um, <laughs> or Good Omens as well. Or mm. Jessica Jones. Or just. Oh. Um, yeah, anyway. Um, <laughs> what noise was that? I don't know. Let's not, let's not oh make it again. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, that was out of something out of Boulder's Gate. Um, and then Olivia Coleman, I also met um, for a split second. Um, so when we were running, um, naturally, when you're on hard marble floor and they're filming, you've got the boom mics, but these boom mics pick up everything. So naturally, if you're running on a hard surface and they're trying to film these actors and the sound's reverberating, 
the boom mic will hear the <laughs> of your footsteps. So they do things to try and mitigate that, whether it's carpet or in my case, they basically gave me like foam pads to put on the bottom of my shoe. For some reason, the crew member decided to put them on me like inline skates. So instead of doing, you know, like two and two, like four, no, I had a line. I had a thin line of my ankle like that either side. And I had to, I was one of the youngest people on set uh, when we did these shots. And the stairs always look so barren. And they're like, you're young. Go up the stairs, go down the stairs, go up the stairs. And I was knackered. It was five days of filming or something. And I spent five days basically running up and down stairs. I'd run to the top, change my outfit, run back down, change my outfit, run back up. That was it. That was my gig. No um, wonder your ankles are made of Play-Doh. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you're literally. Um, speaking of that, so on one scene, I had to run away from the camera down this corridor. Um, and the camera was behind me and I was in the background to the camera. And as I'm running... Um, my Play-Doh ankle gave up and was like, I don't fancy functioning anymore. So I twisted it <laughs> and I could feel myself falling on camera. And I was like, I'm not going to just be that guy in the background who just plummets and slides <laughs> across the floor. So I quickly darted down this corridor, a very or through this door and kind of ran my shoulder into it, went through the door and hit a wall. And I was just kind of on the floor like, ow. And I just heard, that was spectacular, dear. And lo and behold, Olivia Coleman was just sat on her phone looking at me like, are you all right? Um, I was just like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks. And again, and then the, the director was like, everyone back. And she's like, you better go back. I was like, thanks. So that was my very small but short interaction with those two. And again, just brilliant. Um, mm. But feeding into the lunch queue bit. So I said I had a walk on with um, industry. And basically the scene was a guy who's on some form of substance basically tried to run out of these double set of doors at a party. But in front of the double set of doors was basically this glass pane sculpture, um, which he runs into um, and then bounces off it and then kind of like confused, tries to run into it again to get through these doors <laughs> and bounces off it again, blood up the wall, yada, yada. And I had to go, and he was one of the lead actors for the show, so I had to go pick him up, carry him. Um, and I was actually one of the people who picked him up and then he kind of like shoves me, rough ruggeds me, goes, hits the wall, then I had to pick him up again and drag him. and something on those lines. Um, and when I got asked to do it, again, this wasn't an audition, this wasn't this. I was stood in the right place at the right time and they said, oh, we need someone to do this. And the director went, you and just I was just like all right sure um I'll do it which was really funny because the costume department on industry rightfully so uh not hated me that's the wrong word but they were just like oh it's you because I always managed to untuck my shirt one of them referred to me as the duck because I always had a tail and again this is like a, a pristine prestigious stockbroker and there's me walking around with my shirt untucked and looking like that chavvy school kid. The Jar Jar um, Binks of us. <laughs> yeah, literally, literally, literally. <laughs> so apparently, when the director said to the costume party, this is who we've got for the uh, the walk-on, the costume lady, one of them admitted that the other one went, oh, really? Him? Uh, like, as a bit of a, oh, for God's sake. Um, but I got on very well with them. Um, at least I think I did. She's probably like, no. Um, but when I did it... Um, I found myself at the back of the lunch queue. And again, industry was big, mine. There was like 100 essays, the main actors, the crew, et cetera. And I found myself at the back. And they, now that I was a walk-on, they went, oh, no, Ryan, you got to be at the front. You're, you're, you're in the next scene. Get to the front. And they pulled me to the front of the queue. And all the other essays were like, oh, uh, 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 um, So I got <laughs> put to the front of the queue. And then as I'm eating, you know, they're going, you know, this is the person who's going to handle your costume for the scene. This is the person who's going to handle your makeup for the scene. You know, they're coming in, they're brushing me with foundation and all this. And I'm like, I was an extra like 10 minutes what ago. What is going on here? What is going on? You know, <laughs> it's weird. Everyone, like the director and all that coming over to me. They're talking, like the main actors, I said hello to the guy to work with. He's like, lovely to meet you and all this. Talking to them. Did the scene, yada, yada, you know, and I'm still getting makeup. They're still like, do you want anything? Do you need the water? Do you want this? And I'm like, no, I'm good, thanks. Um, and then the next day, I turned back up to set, and I found myself in the lunch queue higher up, and they were like, SA? And this is like someone who put me as like the walk-on on the previous day, and I was like, yeah. He was like, back of the line, mate. I was like, well, this is a full from, it's been a day, full from grace here, <laughs> sculpt to the back. And then I've got all the essays going, ooh, dickhead. <laughs> I'm sure I was dreaming. I'm sure I was dreaming. Um, for those in the chat, if you want to fire your questions away now, Ask Ryan one more question, and then we'll get to all of your all of your lovely questions. So, if you want to fire some stuff in now, 
feel free and we'll get to it shortly. Um, last thing I want to ask you before we get to the Q&A, uh, do you have a dream franchise to be a part of and what would your dream fictional character be to play? Because I know that you're a fan of many, many franchises, so I'd love to know mm. the answer to this. This is hard. So I've always thought about this. As an actor, if you act, you think about these things, who would I play? Because here's the thing. I know who I would say like, oh yeah, that'd be my dream role. But I also know that I wouldn't do it justice. So one of my dream ones when I was younger was always Nathan Drake Uncharted. Mm. But if I'm being honest, if I was to be on Uncharted, I'd probably be Harry Flynn from Uncharted 2, who's British, because I can't do an American accent, but also is more familiar to my personality-ish. Um, again, I'd probably something in the Halo universe if they did it properly, like an ODST, as I mentioned earlier, that'd be pretty sick. I'd be happy being a clone trooper, mind. I'd just be a clone trooper. I'd be, I'd be <laughs> set with that. Um, again, if I, if I don't really match the character of Sora from Kingdom Hearts, I don't know how they do Kingdom Hearts. Live action Yu Gi Oh! They could probably end up playing Joey. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm not sure recently, um, what character, again, you know, I'm quite frantic, but I don't think I'd be able to pull Joker off to a, a good enough, like, you know, when you've got Heath Ledger and Mark Hamill, who's my personal goat Joker, you know, I wouldn't even, that's the other thing, I wouldn't want to try, I wouldn't be able to meet that standard, and I know that for a character like that. So I probably want to end up as a character that's, you know, in a universe that I'd want to be in. But as I was saying to you, closest to myself. And in truth, I don't know who off the top of my head are the things I like that would be. Because, yeah, I'd, I'd probably want to be me in a, a character that's closest to me yeah. in a thing. Whether it's Halo or if they did Mass Effect or something like that. I don't know. But yeah, I can't really think of anything because I just wouldn't be able to do it justice i suppose in that's my a mind. really interesting really interesting perspective of looking at actually because obviously last week we asked the same question to jason mm. and where it's his voice and he can adapt his voice and etc and you're yeah. not on screen yourself it's a completely different question so it's interesting to, to hear you say that i because i would have thought you would have gone i don't know some someone in star wars or marvel yeah. for example it's interesting to hear you say oh no i, I don't know who i fit rather than who I would want to play, and I'd want to play someone who I fit. So yeah, it's very, yeah, very interesting way of looking at it. I could tell you the characters I love, you know, Thrawn, Cad Bane, yada, yada, but I'm not them. I mean, mm. Like, yes, and people say, oh, acting is, you know, becoming that person. Yes, but if you look, particularly for your first <laughs> role, as we said earlier, Ryan Reynolds, Deadpool, Robert Downey Jr., Iron Man, Steve, Captain America... Um, Chris Evans, you know, they are all... Tom Hiddleston auditioned for Thor. He got made Loki. And you see why. Benedict Cumberbatch, Sherlock. They all did works before, but they're most notable characters. Typically, I mean, again, Smile, Benedict Cumberbatch is, again, versatile. Again, they're all versatile. But I think for my first role, if I was to play anything, it would be whatever's closest to me. And then I'd want to act into... You know, I've always thought, would I want to be someone like Gambit for some, for example, in the X-Men or Nightwing or Red Hood? Red Hood's one I've always thought that I'd fit quite well, um, more personality wise, or maybe Dick Grayson. Um, I wouldn't be Batman again. I don't think I'd be Batman. I'm not good looking enough. Um, yeah, then again, Nightwing's Nightwing's pretty good looking. So, <laughs> but um, I thought you were gonna, I thought you were going to say Peppa Pig, but never mind. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not that refined. We'll get to some George. of the questions. Um, Alex has asked, which sex ed characters did Ryan know? And did you meet any? I, how did so, you meet them, sorry? I wasn't personally on sex ed. But when they did ex sex education, they, again, when they did extras, they cast a lot of people who were locals. And because sex ed was filmed in a school, and again, they brought people to be recurring characters. So there are people who were on all seasons of sex ed from when they were younger to when they were older. Um, so I personally didn't, but I do know friends who were, I'll be, I'll be really honest here. I haven't watched sex ed. I, yeah, don't worry but about I the, knew, last, the last season. Don't worry about the rest. Right. Good. Okay. 
But the lady who apparently is the spitting image of Margot Robbie, for example, I had a friend who was in scenes with her and stuff and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. But I personally wasn't on Sex Ed and I didn't meet them as such. Tell will want their contact details and how they can contact them and Mackie. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> um, and Harry is asked, any advice for budding actors? Oh, that's always a good one. That's always like... So... I think the the first realization is it is, and this comes back to being you. The industry is the most cut. That industry is the most cutthroat industry in the world because, and I think the thing, something that it br can breed is insecurity because the whole concept of it is you present what you think is your best character, and you can be told basically no, and a lot of people perceive that as an individual being not good enough. And I think it's Brian Cranston in one of his masterclasses who sums it up the best, which is basically the best way to think about it is the director has created a painting. And it, let's say the let's say the director said paint a bridge and the director has a, pic, a picture of a bridge that they have painted and they tell 50 people paint a bridge. And whoever's bridge matches their bridge the most, that's who they're going to pick. That doesn't mean that that person was necessarily by the best the most versatile, the most so-and-so actor, but they fit that role the best. And I think that something that a lot of people tend to do, particularly, is sacrifice, you know, the aspects. Again, acting, of course, you do need to merge into the character, but there will always naturally be aspects of you that exist in that character. So don't get, there's, there's people out there that, like Tom Hardy, for example, like he is, again phenomenal um and him in for example peaky blinders and stuff where he really morphs that's incredible um and you do get actors like that but then there's other actors who play themselves well and that's not mm -hmm. necessarily a detriment um you know you've you've always got your daniel day lewis's and your others who are in that pantheon of you know actors who are able to morph into that other person but then you know you look at certain other characters they play they're like themselves <laughs> but they mould that to the character they're playing um, in a fantastic way. And I think something that a lot of actors do is think that, you know, they're, they aren't good enough as themselves. They have to be this. But I would say keep aspects of your personality. Don't afraid to be you when mm -hmm. interpreting the character. I don't think people do that enough, really, because that's what they're... It's not a case of you're not the right... You're not good enough. It's a case of you're not the right fit for whatever they were looking for. I mean, again, prime example, let's say, you know, when Star Wars, um, the first of the sequel trilogy, Force Awakens came out, they did mass auditions, didn't they? They got everybody to turn up and to audition for different roles. And they had, they hired Daisy Ridley and John Boyega. But if you didn't know what they were looking to cast, then, you know, you might have thought, oh, I'm not good enough. I, I'm not good enough to be the Stormtrooper. But they had a specific character and fit in mind. And that's something that people don't really remember all the time. So mm -hmm. be you, just give it your best and be willing to... And also don't take unpaid gigs that much because I feel that a lot of actors get taken advantage of for that lust or that lull of, oh, I, I want to be it. And they kind of sacrifice their values and everything to try and meet that. So yeah. and then I suppose, and then I suppose you get typecast as well in the same sense of as oh, they do it for free. Yeah, mm. literally, literally. Yeah. Um, Tells asked. Oh, Ryan said, uh, "Ryan, Harry said, thank you. Cheers, Harry." Uh, and Tells asked, "What role do you think suits you best? Hero, villain, or anti-hero?" D and D terms: chaotic neutral. Um. <laughs> um I'd, I'd like, you know, everyone likes to think... Do you know what? I'm, I'm going to go one further. I tend to play or be in roles that are... How do I explain it? A series like Game of Thrones or Arcane, as it were, where there is no true good guy, bad guy, villain, mm -hmm. as it were. It's not always as cut and dry as that. I tend to find myself... You know, the typical things I get cast in are like war films in which, you know you've got two sides fighting each other from each perspective. It's, I tend to fit more in character spaces. Don't get me wrong. If I could, I'd love, who doesn't love playing a good villain? Um, you know, uh, but most of the things that I tend to be in, you know, you, if you're talking protagonist, antagonist, I tend to end up as the ones that kind of flip between um, mm -hmm. 
in the sense of, you know, again, maybe that's just because I haven't had a role that is hero or villain. A lot of the things I've played are the ones that move between. They're the, you know, they can be either or. Um, yeah. So if I'd want to play a role that suits me best, again, something like a protagonist character, again, we'll say Halo, or maybe the closest representation is Mal from Firefly, something like Firefly, where the good, the protagonist you follow, not necessarily a good person, they're just doing what they have to do to get by. Walking Dead's another example of that, where good yeah. characters have to make nasty decisions. That's mm -hmm. the type of roles I tend to find myself in, not, you know, clear, cut and dry. He's good, he's evil. I tend to be in a world where everyone is all out for themselves or there's different agendas. Yeah, very cool. I can imagine you in The Walking Dead, actually. I wouldn't want to mess with you in The Walking Dead either. If any, well, for those who don't know, which is basically everybody in the chat, Ryan is also a black belt in Taekwondo. So I wouldn't want to get on the wrong yeah, side but, of him in an apocalypse. But, but with my Play-Doh ankles, I've probably collapsed and be bitten in the first minute. <laughs> that's true, that's true. If we ever end up in an apocalypse, go for his ankles. <laughs> um, that is basically it for our questions. I will quickly dab onto this one, but um, feel free not to. But Alex has asked, can Ryan give oh, us a you bastard. <laughs> William. Um, definitely don't have to, but uh... I I'm as much as I want to for the sake of my actual employment, I won't. <laughs> but I'll this is gonna make it sound even worse. I'll give him a private performance one time. Uh <laughs> that sounds even worse. Yeah, yeah but yes. oh, I'm story behind that from because it's gonna be asked. I don't even know how it came about. A-level geography. We were on a school trip and I was very much enjoying Robbie Williams' candy and in a ADHD rage, for some reason, decided to dance on the table <laughs> singing candy uh, on an A-level geography trip, which became very memorable. And then I ended up doing it for the A-level geography teacher for his leaving video. I ended up doing it again. Um so, yeah, that's a memory that haunts me. Thank you for the reminder, Alex. I'll, I'll get him to do yeah. his primary school poem he did once. <laughs> oh. Sounds like a very interesting <laughs> evening. Um, that was a that was ass. <laughs> Gollum impression. Gollum impression. God. Um, don't really do Gollum. I'll try. I don't mind making a fool of myself, but I'm not anticipating it to be anything good. Andy Circus, I am not. Um, he kind of hunches over, doesn't he? He's kind of like, he's like, I got a ring. There he goes. He's like, precious. Something like that. There's a crack. <laughs> oh, look at that. <laughs> what is that? It's Lego Golem. I don't know why Bless. I've not seen him before. I don't have any Lord of the Rings sets. Shut up. Um, Shut up. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stupid, anyway. <laughs> Shut up. Uh, thank you very much for your questions, everyone. Um, I'd quickly like to switch to YouTube, if you don't mind. Um, yeah. What drove you to start your channel? And do you think that your experience in industry gave you that sort of edge when you first started your channel? Because a lot of YouTubers, myself mm. included, when you first start off, when you go back even like a few months prior, you notice a huge difference between the way that you talk to camera, the way that you talk to an audience or um, talk to chat, etc. cetera. Um, but if you go back to your first original videos, it seems like you'd already beaten that first sort of obstacle, if you like. Mm. Oh, thank you. Um, COVID, ADHD <laughs> and boredom, to answer the first question, why did I start it? Um, I always knew, I always thought that I'd enjoy doing games. Um, and I'll be honest, YouTube, from the entertainment perspective, I love doing, you know, I love doing the video with yourself with the Bean Boozle Challenge. Um, I think the thing I did wrong with my YouTube channel in hindsight, for anyone who does YouTube, is I try to create videos that would draw an audience in hopes that it would draw traffic to my channel. But mm -hmm. the problem is, is, what I ended up driving to, but I didn't enjoy making those videos. I merely did it to draw traffic, but they did very well. But the problem is, is people were only coming to my channel for those videos. So I was having to do videos I didn't enjoy to facilitate drawing traffic. So I do, you know, 
for anyone who's the channel was a web away for anyone and i did videos tutorials on a, a horror game called dark deception which is basically horror pac-man on steroids um and i played it a few times and the videos got you know like 60 views 100 views whereas i then did full tutorials which was a lot of effort. This was playing the game for hours, understanding the mechanics, capturing all the footage for editing, and then editing it myself, which would take weeks at a time. Um, that was not enjoyable for me, but that would draw over... I mean, one of the videos, I think, had over way over 10,000 views, and it does now. Um, probably even higher, to be honest. Um, and But that viewership never translated into the other videos. So I found myself doing something I didn't enjoy, and it was, and I fixed myself on that path of if I wanted to continue YouTube and make it viable, I was going to have to make videos I didn't like and doing tutorials as well. I couldn't pay someone else to edit the footage for me because if they didn't understood understand how the game worked, then the footage wouldn't make sense unless I did a real detailed yeah. description. So yeah, so it became unviable for me in that regard. Um, the other thing that became unviable was my PC became very outdated. Um, and Dark Deception, the game, got a full revamp. They called it Dark Deception Remastered or the upgraded version. And my PC suddenly couldn't run OBS and Dark Deception at the same time. So I couldn't capture footage anyway. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but in regards to the question about breaking the barrier, it's different. Because when you're acting, you're pretending a camera's not there and you're acting as a character, but as natural mm. as a character as you can. Um, I'm quite an eccentric individual. And if I was to be me as a character in a show, people would probably be like, oh, he's overacting. He's over the top. Um, possibly. Maybe not. But again, it's... Whereas when you're doing YouTube and something, there's a camera here. We talk to this camera. We talk to an audience. Whereas you're playing for a camera that doesn't exist when you act. So it's slightly roles reversed. But I've always been done public speaking and stuff, so I don't mind speaking in front of cameras and stuff. Yeah, that's interesting. I never thought of it like that, as in, yeah, you're pretending the camera's not there. So it's there is a sort of similarity, but in the same in the same sense, it's completely different. So Yeah, well, you can't lock yeah. eyes with it. Imagine watching the screen, someone just goes... I mean, The Office do it, and it works. G-Hulk. The... Yeah, exactly. G-Hulk, and that went down a treat, didn't it? <laughs> Breaking the fourth wall works in certain contexts, um, mm. but if you were doing, you know, if James Bond's fighting someone who's shooting and you see him go, <laughs> Doesn't really work. <laughs> Got him. Mm. <laughs> Sean Connery might be able to pull it off. Mm. Got him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, as content creators, um, as you were saying, touched upon, then you're always always looking for approval from others. For example, I'll be looking at the stats of the stream for the next week yeah. and like eagerly watching the, the numbers grow and bits and pieces of that. Is that the sort why of thing? Why did I break that... him on? <laughs> well, yeah. like why, didn't he sing, why didn't he sing candy? Who is this? Um, uh... Nobody. Oh, no, um, no. Is that what you found yourself doing? Did you find yourself like looking at analytics and like you were driven to do it because of the analytics rather than, as you said, not, in, not enjoying what you were making? Yeah, and I think that's what... I did wrong. I focused on trying to grow the channel immediately. And again, by that logic, I put myself on the wrong path compared to doing what I did for fun. And again, I think the other thing is, is what I would want to do with YouTube has died. Um, back in the days where you had your Jacksepticeyes, your Markiplier's, your PewDiePie's, mm. play what you love, enjoy it, you get viewership. Whereas now, because it's so saturated, you pick a game, that is your game. You do not leave it. Um, unless, of course, you get big enough that you are able to flit and move on. Um, but, you know, you look at more recent content creators, maybe like Laserbeam, his break came from Fortnite. Um, Seagull, someone I used to watch who came big because of Overwatch. Ninja because of Fortnite. Um, a lot of the more recent, bigger, typical um YouTube stars that have kind of risen through the ranks, Chris MD, football, they all fit their niche. Mm. They do their own things now because they have the capacity to, but yeah. they all sat within that one game, and I don't have the capacity to do that. I think it's I think it's finding a balance. It's it's trying to stay within a, a niche to an extent. Yeah. Just it's just making sure the umbrella you're you're buying is big enough for what you want. If you yeah. 
it's a it's, it is a very awkward one. YouTube is a funny old space. Um, do you reckon you'll ever come back? Once my computer's updated, maybe. I mean, I've been talking about this. I want to play Hell Divers with friends, um, but I can barely run Minecraft. So there's going to have to be a revamp at some point. And when that happens, I don't know when, because I'm paying for a wedding at the moment, and I bought a house. Yeah. So when financially it becomes viable, then maybe I might consider it, but I think I'd restart again. I'd find something. I'd try and find a game I love or... Again, I couldn't do it alone again either. I'd have to do it with a group. I'd have to do it with people that I can... I, I personally feel myself I'm better when I can banter and jive with people. I Yeah. On my own, I can be a bit much. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've noticed that actually in the last eight months or so since I've been... Mm. I've started this again is that the sort of the community... Uh, of YouTube's changed, but I think since COVID, I think during lockdown it was very, very full on because no one had anything else to do. So you either got like a really nice side of people, or quite a nasty side of people as well, actually. Mm. And there was no like middle ground. Where now, YouTube as a community is a really, really good space to be in, it's especially everybody here in the chat. This is this is why, this is why I do it. Um, I know that's why other people do it as well. Um, believe it or not. It's just gone 10 o'clock, so we are coming yeah. towards the end of the show. Believe it or not, time has flown by once again. Uh, I'd like to say a massive thank you to Ryan for coming on, sharing his time with us, uh, beyond grateful, and I'm your insights. Fan, um, I was really, you're welcome. You're absolutely welcome. Um, there was, a, yeah, quite a few things that you said um, from the aspect of like being an SA and stuff that like I would never have thought, and hopefully um, budding actors like Harry uh, will take away some of those sort of Inspiration. You get a range at least. You're, like, you're going at the bottom of the pool. Like last week, you had like you know voice actor up here. You're, you're getting a range <laughs> at least. <laughs> that's, that's the point we want. We want to talk yeah. to people that have been in all different aspects of the industry. So yeah, it's really, really good chat, and I really do appreciate it. Um, hopefully, we can do this again. Maybe even a live from Comic Con Wells. Who knows? As yeah, we're sort of in between each other there, and that's um, yes, that's, that's coming around quite quickly. Yeah. Who knows? Who so, knows? Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, if you haven't already, make sure you give the QR code a scan and check out some of the bits and pieces that Ryan has done. Thank you all for watching and tuning in with myself and Ryan this evening. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, please do leave the live with a big thumbs up and subscribe if you're new. And don't forget, join me next week again, same time, Monday, 9 p.m. And next week, we will be joined by actor Rory Ross, who has starred in The Mandalorian as a Mandalorian. Obi Wan Kenobi, Are you, Book of Boba Fett. It is a Star Wars themed week next week, so I cannot wait for that one. Uh, yeah, been a brilliant stream. Thank you all for watching. Ta da.